Well, good morning. I believe every Lord's Day is important. And we have another one, important one coming up next week, and another important one coming up in a couple of weeks. I appreciate Steve mentioning our uh, special day, the first Sunday of April. Uh, just a little extra emphasis for us to invite friends, family, uh, any, any number of categories of people. There's a little article in the bulletin today of uh, suggestions of kinds of people, if you're struggling with somebody, that you might ask, but there is an infinite number of possibilities. There's a method to our madness for, for having that day on April 2nd. Uh, Usually, the biggest uh, church attendance day of the year is Easter Sunday, which is the following Sunday. Uh, and so, if we can get a friend to come the week before, and then possibly get them to come the week after, we might really have our hooks in them. And you say, that sounds terrible, have your hooks in them. But the Lord said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. So take it up with him. All right. Our hooks do not hurt. Good to be together. I hope, hope you will be uh, participating in that day. And glad to see you here today. There was a wo woman's husband who had been slipping in and out of a coma for several months. She had been very faithful and stayed by his bedside every day. And one day he... He rallied and came to and motioned for her to come over. And she sat by him and um, he whispered to her, eyes sort of full of tears. He said, you know what? You've been with me through all the hard times. When I got fired, you were there to support me. When the business failed, you were there. When I got shot, you were right there by my side. When the house burned down, you stayed. When my health started failing, you were still by my side. You know what? And, and she, she's very touched, and, and, and she says, what, dear? Her heart sort of filling with warmth, and he says, I think you're bad luck. Now, not what she was hoping to hear, right? Not what she was hoping to hear. Probably not what she needed to hear at that moment. But sometimes that's the way life is. Another example, there was a preacher who had been visiting a man. He was in prison. He was actually in death, on death row. And the minister... Uh, had established a good rapport with him. And so as the time approached for the execution, it was uh, years ago, and so the method at that time was the electric chair. And as the time approached for that, the preacher was asked to, to be there at the time of the execution to minister to the man on, on his way to his death. And so when the day arrived, the preacher went to be with the convict, and he was very anxious about what to say. What do you say at a time like that? And he thought through things, and, you know, um, to say goodbye seemed trite. Um, to say see you later seemed inappropriate. And he became sort of desperate for the right words, and so just as they got to the, the moment and got to the electric chair, he just blurted out, more power to you. <laughs> and again, you might not appreciate that bad joke, but I bet you appreciate even less when somebody says the wrong thing at the wrong time. You've probably had even worse things said than that. Don't you appreciate people who know the right thing to say 
at the appropriate time. They don't even have to say much, just as long as it's right and it's timely. Those kinds of people with those types of words can be a real blessing to our lives. Now, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, the message that we, we shared, if you didn't look carefully at the title of the sermon today, you might think you're getting the same lesson. But today, uh, we're talking about me and you and Barnabas. Uh, a couple weeks ago, it was me and you and Barabbas. Both characters, of course, are very prominent major New Testament characters. Barabbas is mentioned in all four Gospels. That's a pretty rare thing. Uh, Barnabas actually comes on the scene in Acts chapter 4, and I'd like to us to start by, by reading that text together in Acts 4. It begins at verse 32, just so we see the first time that we meet Barabbas. It says there, now the full number of those who believed were one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So again, this is uh, where we're first meeting Barnabas in Scripture, Acts chapter 4. He becomes a a very significant part of the story in Acts, as well as uh, being mentioned several times in the letters of Paul and, and things like that in the New Testament. But these two characters that we've taken a couple of weeks to focus on Totally different people, uh, though they share similar name, at least a, an element of their name. This, this bar, this son of element. And you might remember that Barabbas uh, meant son of the father. Today we're going to talk about what Barnabas means. We associate Barnabas with one major characteristic, encouragement. And when we first read his name here in Acts chapter 4, he's described as a generous person, a generous man who sold some property that he owned. He brought the proceeds from that sale to the apostles. There were a lot of people in need in that early church many of them, no doubt, being abandoned by their families when they became Christians, losing their employment, that kind of thing. A lot of people in need in that Jerusalem church. And so those who had means, like Barnabas, were ministering in this way, blessing those who were in need. You might not have realized that his, his real name was Joseph. Uh, Barnabas was a nickname, apparently, that he received from the apostles. And again, look at what that name means. Son of what? Son of encouragement. Well, there are, there are a lot of sons of in the Bible. Uh, son of Jonah, Bar Jonah, that was Peter. Um, There's even a character referred to as Bar-Jesus, son of Jesus. There are the sons of thunder. There's uh, one called the son of the right hand. Usually it's not translated that way. We know him as Benjamin in the Old Testament. But here we have 
son of encouragement. And uh, just looking on a little bit about some other things we see about him, the next time we hear of Barnabas after Acts chapter 4 is, is up in chapter 9. Chapter 9 of Acts is the chapter that starts out with Saul of Tarsus. He's sort of terrorizing the early church, the early Christians, wherever he can find them. He's persecuting them. And, and then Saul has his moment where he's confronted with the truth. He's confronted um, by the resurrected Jesus on the Damascus Road. He is struck blind when he has this vision. And eventually the disciple uh, named Ananias comes and teaches Saul further. And he is baptized into Christ. And the next thing you know, this former killer of disciples of Christ is proclaiming Christ. He is preaching Jesus in the synagogues. And so you have this amazing transformation take, pl take place in the life of this man, Saul, who becomes Paul. But very soon, reality sets in. And here's the reality. It is much harder for the church to accept a transformed Paul than it is for Jesus to accept a transformed Paul. And that's a problem. It's much easier for Jesus to accept him than it is for his church to accept him. The Christians, by and large, don't trust his conversion. And I assume that we can sympathize with them in that. If you look at chapter 9 of, of Acts, one other passage I want us to read this morning, beginning at verse 26. Um, listen to what it says describing this situation. And when he had come to Jerusalem, the he is Paul. When he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. So I want you to notice once again the role of Barnabas in this. What's he do? He is a buffer between Paul and the members of the church. When people feared Paul, Barnabas came alongside. He was there to put an arm around Paul and show there was no longer any need to be afraid of him. When brothers and sisters in Christ just had a hard time believing that this man was actually a disciple of Jesus, this man who had arrested them, thrown them in prison, and no doubt killed some of them. When they had a hard time believing he was now a, a follower of the Lord, Barnabas was there to step forward and tell how it all happened on the Damascus Road, what had taken place. When no one wanted to invite Paul to church, no one wanted to have him in their assembly, Barnabas made the appointments for him. And so gradually his influence grew more and more. And did you notice in the last verse that we read there the result of this? The church everywhere 
was being built up and it was growing by leaps and bounds. Nearly every time we read the name Barnabas in the New Testament, there's a verse somewhere close by that mentions the growth of the church. That is no accident, people. That's no accident. The church will never grow without people like Barnabas. A major growth ingredient for the church is significant amounts of encouragement. Encouragement. It's significant numbers of Barnabas type people. You know, encouragement, it's one of those words that's a little bit hard to define, but you certainly know encouragement when you see it. And, and uh, definitely you know it when you receive it. We know that good feeling, don't we? Well, I imagine most of us have heard the story of Isaac Newton's famous encounter with a falling apple. You know, Newton uh, sort of introduced the laws of gravity in the 1600s and, and revolutionized the study of astronomy. A lot of people know his name, Isaac Newton. Very few people know part of the backstory to that. They, they don't, don't know much the name of a man named uh, Edmund Halley. Edmund Halley was closely associated with Newton, and in fact, you may never heard of Isaac Newton um, if it hadn't been for Edmund Halley. It was Halley who challenged Newton to think through his original notions of things, and, and Halley sort of corrected Newton's errors early on, some of his mathematical errors. He, he prepared geometrical figures to support his discoveries. Halley actually coaxed uh, Newton. He was very hesitant to publish his ideas, and he coaxed him to, to publish his great work, which is uh, known as the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Uh, Halley edited that book and supervised publication of it and actually financed it, even though Newton had a lot more money than Halley. But he believed so much in what he was doing. Um, you know, Newton easily could have afforded the publishing of the book. Halley financed it. Historians call it one of the most selfless examples in, in the annals of science. Newton, almost immediately upon publication, began to reap the benefits of, of that fame. And uh, Halley really didn't get any credit. Halley did use the principles to predict the orbit and the return of the comet that would uh, later bear his name, but it was only after his death that he received any acclaim for that. And because the comet only comes around every 76 years, uh, it's pretty infrequent that anybody thinks of Halley. Halley remained a devoted scientist throughout his life who didn't care who received credit as long as the cause was being advanced. I just tell that as an illustration of something that we see in many New Testament personalities. I think the same thing can be said about many people that we read about in Scripture. People like, for instance, John the Baptist. You remember John's attitude? Remember that he said of Jesus, he must become greater I must become less. And especially somebody like Barnabas, 
who seem to be content just to make the lives of other people better. To stay in the background, to pave the way for the success of others, like he did for Paul. That's the kind of thing that advances God's kingdom, folks. It cannot advance without that kind of thing. It's an element you have to have. And it's a great study to go into every reference to, to Barnabas and, and really think them through in the New Testament. We don't have time to do that in detail. I just want to mention a couple that you might search out a little bit more in your own study. Acts chapter 11, Barnabas is described there as a person who was glad when the church up in Antioch started to uh, succeed and started to grow. Uh, he, he rejoices in that and he exhorts them to remain faithful. Another place he's described as a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And of course it says right after that in Acts chapter 11, verse 24, and a great many people were added to the Lord. See? When Barnabas does his thing, people come to the Lord. Barnabas and his encouraging nature was a significant element in the growth of the early church. Barnabas brought Paul to Antioch, introduced him to the church there just like he did to the church in Jerusalem. He stayed with him at Antioch for a full year. Now, Antioch's really important because it becomes home base for mission work. And they always send out missionaries from Antioch, and two of the earliest missionaries that were sent out were Paul and Barnabas. In chapter 13, verse 1 of Acts, Barnabas is described as a prophet and a teacher. And then, very soon after that, a missionary. He goes with Paul and begins traveling, and, and they, they start out on that first missionary journey together. And it is hard to imagine the great influence they have in that first trip. Every place they go, they establish a church. They plant the church. They appoint leaders, elders in those churches and build those places up. And as you read the story... Gradually, Paul becomes more and more prominent and Barnabas recedes, sort of fades into the background and you get the, the feeling that that did not bother Barnabas at all, that he was perfectly fine with that. He didn't have to have the headlines. He didn't clamor for attention. He just did some work and guess what? The church grew. The church grew because of it. The famous story of Paul and Barnabas and a younger man named John Mark. You can read about this in the 15th chapter of Acts. And I'm going to leave that to you to study out some more. But there's a conflict that develops among this mission team. And again you find when that happens that Barnabas steps in and, and sort of intercedes in a really significant way and he encourages John, John Mark, um, at a very critical moment of his life and maybe saved his future influence for the church in doing so. Do you ever think that without Barnabas maybe we don't even have the gospel according to Mark? very possible but for Barnabas who can calculate and who can quantify the good influence of Barnabas on the early church no one can do it except the Lord and it's still true today it's impossible to fully appreciate the efforts of a good encourager 
in the Lord's church in the modern world. We ought to all seek to have a little bit of Barnabas in us. Maybe a lot of Barnabas in us. There were two men, both of them very seriously ill. They were sharing the same hospital room. One man, uh, his condition, he was allowed to sit up in his bed for an hour every afternoon and sort of help drain the, the fluid from his lungs. His bed was positioned next to the room's only window. The other man, the other bed, had to spend all his time flat on his back. He wasn't allowed to move. They spent a lot of time, weeks, in this hospital room together. They, they talked for hours on end, um, spoke of their wives, their, their homes, their jobs, their involvement in the military, where they had been on vacation, everything they could think of. And every afternoon, when the man that was in the bed by the window could sit up, he would pass the time by describing to his roommate all the things that he could see outside the window. The man in the other bed, as you can imagine, began to live for those one-hour periods where his world could be broadened and enlivened by all the activity and the color of the world outside as described by the man by the window. A uh, window overlooked a park, had a lovely lake, animals, ducks, and, and swans playing on the water. He, he would describe that. He talked about the children playing in the park, young people in love walking ar ar arm in arm, Describe the flowers of the park, every color of the rainbow represented grand old trees. He would depict in his description, and, and then even there was a view of the city skyline in the distance. And he just would go on in great detail describe what he saw out the window. And, and, uh, and the man on the other side of the room in the other bed would close his eyes and imagine what's being described. Well, one, one afternoon, for example, the man by the window described a parade that was passing by, and the other man couldn't hear it, uh, but he could see it in his mind's eye. He could see it as the gentleman by the window portrayed it with very descriptive words. This went on for a long period of time. Weeks passed, and one morning, the day nurse arrived to bring water for their baths, and, and she found the lifeless body of the man by the window. He had died peacefully in his sleep. She was saddened because they all had grown very fond of him. She called the hospital attendants in to take the body away. As soon as it seemed appropriate, the, the other man asked if he could be switched in position to be by the window. The nurse was happy to make the switch. And after making sure that he was comfortable, she left him alone. Very slowly and quite painfully, he propped himself up on one elbow get his first look at the world outside in many, many weeks. Finally, he would be able to see all the great scenery that had been described. And he strained to slowly turn and look out the window beside the bed. And when he looked, it faced a blank wall. And the man asked the nurse, what could have compelled his now deceased roommate who had described such wonderful things outside the window and the nurse responded that actually the man was blind and he couldn't even see the wall 
And she said, perhaps he just wanted to encourage you. Oh, the power of encouragement. Folks, I hope you don't leave this assembly today without either encouraging someone or being encouraged. Let's be Barnabas. Let's pray. Father, thank you for building us up and strengthening us today by giving us this day to praise your name, to remember your son and his sacrifice for us, and help us now to go and share those blessings with a world that needs it so much. Help us be encouragers of our world and pray your blessings on each one here and those who aren't able to be here today. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for calling us into your service. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, if we need to pray with you or help you in some way, the, the invitation is extended at this time. We'll sing uh, to encourage you to have time to think about that. If you need to become part of the family of God, be baptized into Christ today, uh, we would really celebrate that with you and help you in any way we can. Let us know if there's something we can do before we leave. Let's stand. Let's sing together.